I feel somewhat bad that my first full video covering a Ducati model is dedicated to a flagship motorcycle that virtually everyone hated. So much so that Ducati immediately did a 180 back to the design style that had preceded it. Interestingly enough, my main resource for this video is the amazing book by Alan Cathcart and Mark Cook, written at the hopeful release of the infamous 999 back in 2003. Needless to say, it is a positive take. You don't just write a 200-page detailed book about a motorcycle that you don't really like. It's actually great because it helps one look beyond the response and actually examine the bike for itself, one of the more fascinating motorcycles to ever come out of baloney. But as we'll see, I actually think the 999 tells a more interesting story than just a failed superbike design. Not only because it would actually prove to stand the test of time and influence Ducati's approach going forward, but also its existence goes beyond just the bike itself, giving us an interesting look at a manufacturer that until relatively recently has had more ups and downs than a typical Jack Miller season. Unlike MV Agusta, who really made their mark in Grand Prix racing through the 1960s, Ducati found their home later on in World Superbike with their revolutionary 90-degree V-twins, and this would actually prove to be a better foundation for modern four-stroke Grand Prix racing. In 1985, now under the ownership of Kajiva and the brilliant Castiglionis, Massimo Bordi, the chief engineer, was commissioned to design an engine that would carry Ducati into the future. The result was the Desmo Quattro, Ducati's first liquid-cooled, fuel-injected engine with more than two valves per cylinder. This would really lay the foundation not only for the power plant of the 999, but also all of Ducati's engines going forward. The 851cc version of this bike would take a stunning upset victory in the first ever new flagship class for World Superbike in 88, a class where twins were allowed to have up to 1,000cc of capacity, but this 850cc bike was competitive. Ducati would take their first World Superbike title in 1990, winning in 91 and 92 as well, and beginning to offer production versions of their race-winning bikes in the form of the 888 SP models. But in 1993, Kawasaki's Scott Russell would hand it to Ducati on the ZXR750, so they went back to the drawing board. But this time, the pen was given to legendary Italian designer Massimo Tamburini, and he would create what many consider to be the single most beautiful motorcycle ever. Now, if you're not a sport bike or modern motorcycle kind of guy, I doubt you'll view it this way. But that's okay. The point is, many did view it that way and many still do. This motorcycle really placed Ducati on the world stage as so much more than just a manufacturer making race bikes. This was Ferrari-esque design, but on two wheels. The 916 was beautiful, sleek, more powerful and more advanced than anything that they had made before it, and the cherry on top for Ducati would be the fact that the 955cc race version with Carl Fogarty on board would retake the World Superbike Championship in 94 and 95. The smaller 748 was incredibly popular on the production side and also dominated the junior supersport class. Despite my contention that MV Agusta should be considered the Ferrari of motorcycles, which of course that's debatable, MV Agusta didn't really even exist at this time. The 916 had officially taken Ducati to that level with their combination of performance and racing success. No Italian manufacturer of motorcycles had done what Ducati did with the 916. The style and beauty and exclusivity, it was everything that you could want from an Italian automotive manufacturer. But despite all of this, Ducati was in trouble. Kajiva, that is Ducati's parent company, wasn't doing so hot. Sure, they'd saved Ducati, but now they were the ones that needed to be saved. So despite Ducati continuing to dominate in World Superbike and winning in 96, production was down by almost half for the company that year. But new ownership of Kajiva helped them to start to build up the structure needed for manufacturing and really everything business-related. Ducati went back and forth with Honda taking championships as the 90s came to a close, and we saw the birth in development of the short-stroke Testostrada engine that would soon power the 999. Despite either winning or taking second place in the World Superbike Championship for the past 12 years, the time came for Ducati to make a new flagship leader bike, and they turned to South African Pierre Terblanche for the design. 
His brief from Ducati was as follows. Make it fast, sexy, and red. Hey, at least they know their identity. Though Terre Blanche had just designed one of the most impractical motorcycles to date, the MH900E, radically designed and radically sold solely on the internet, practicality and function was primary to his design philosophy. And despite his charge to make a motorcycle thoroughly in Ducati's spirit, Terre Blanche's approach to designing this new sport bike was one of asking the question, why not? Why not use this new material? Why not try out this new technology? Why do we have to follow the tradition of making sport bikes uncomfortable or impractical. Though there is much overlap between how Terre Blanche and Tamburini approached design, they did work together quite a bit prior to the design of this bike, and for example, both see the entire motorcycle as one coherent thing with all the parts fitting together, we would see as the 99 would take shape that the differences between how Tamburini and Terre Blanche looked at motorcycles was pretty obvious. With this new motorcycle, Ducati took a big step forward in terms of development. For this bike, they made extensive use of computer modeling and various other pieces of computer technology to not only speed up the process, but really to just perfect everything. This doesn't mean that Terre Blanche wasn't somewhat old school in his approach, from sketching to clay modeling. It just means that when the designs were handed over to the prototype department, everything could really be exacted. In this way, the 999 wasn't just a motorcycle meant to take Ducati forward in terms of sales and production, but it also marked a shift for the company from an old way of designing and developing the motorcycle as a whole to a system really for the future. For example, the days of spending seven years sketching and clay modeling one motorcycle just were done, as Tamburini had with the MV Agusta F4. And as Italian as all of that may sound, and it certainly is, it just doesn't work for a company that really wants to move into the future. Terre Blanche believed that the 916, though beautiful, was a nightmare to actually ride, really any sort of distance, and he wanted this new motorcycle to be the kind of bike that anybody could put down serious miles on and do it pretty comfortably. So he lowered the seat and changed the seat design so that more people could ride the bike, successfully giving the 999 more of a feel that you were riding in the motorcycle versus on it. This is something that we talk about a lot still today with motorcycles, and the idea is that if you're more in the motorcycle, you're more comfortable, versus feeling like you're just on top of this thing. And of course, this is all better for your back and just more enjoyable. In some ways, the whole idea of making a sport bike and a race bike and a super bike that is capable on the track and really as fast as anything but comfortable, a lot of it started in 2003 with the 999. The foot pegs and even the seat tank assembly on the single seat version of the 999 can be adjusted significantly to give you a more personal level of comfort and even tailor the bike to what kind of riding you hoped for. The 999's overall comfort was praised in testing by racers who found that the bike just didn't fatigue them in the same way that the 996 or even the 998 had. Overall, he simplified everything by taking the 916 completely apart, all the way down to its wheels and frame, and just totally redesigning everything. The result was that the 999 had some 23% fewer parts than its predecessor, and mechanically speaking, it was simpler, it was much easier to service as well. Powered by their new Testostrada engine, initially developed for racing, and powering Troy Bayliss to victory in World Superbike in 01, this was a significant step forward for Ducati, but still really an evolution of their previous power plants. This was their tried and tested formula that they would stick with going forward, the 90 degree L-twin, but it was really taken to another level with this bike. With this shorter stroke, higher revving engine featuring oversized valves, the 999 made 140 horsepower, still slightly less than a high revving contemporary sport bike like, for example, the Fireblade. But it made quite a bit more torque and at a lower RPM, something Ducati sport bikes and race bikes are of course still known for. I think it's fair to say that the problem in many riders' eyes with the 999 wasn't really the way it performed. Psycho World's early test of this bike sums it up pretty well. They say, unlike Massimo Tamburini's 916 series and his MV Agusta F4, torture devices on anything other than track days and Sunday morning toots, the 999 can actually be ridden places like a real motorcycle. 
It was faster and better in every way. It won three World Superbike titles in its short life, took more race wins than any Ducati before and most Ducatis after, and it was infinitely better for real-world use. So unless you're a Ducatista purista who believes that part of Ducati's identity must be that their bikes are just totally unusable, this bike was better. But here's the thing, it looked nothing like the 916 or any Ducati for that matter, and fans of the company didn't like it. Terblanche's words about the design upon its release are interesting in light of what would happen at Ducati. He said, I wanted to do something very striking, new, and fresh that would last until 2010. Something that wouldn't become dated after three weeks, and so of course you're going to shock people. I had no intention of doing just another 916. We, meaning Italian manufacturers, or just Ducati in general, need to build bikes that will last six or seven years in the marketplace. We can't go for instant gratification. Now this is all from that book I mentioned by Alan Cathcart. I'll put links so that you guys can check out that book. It's pretty amazing. The book notes that the reason a company like Ducati wants designs that last longer than a few years is that they simply can't afford to redesign or reskin the 999 in two or three years. But here's the thing, that's exactly what would happen. This design this look that this bike had was all to serve function. Terblanche describes the bike's style as basically the nicest wrapper that they could make to fit around the mechanicals and to fulfill the role that he wanted the bike to fulfill. It had to be comfortable, for example, for a pillion. The tank, something that many designers just kind of fit in there to look nice, had more purpose. It had to fit nicely for your knees or it didn't work for him. Every single aspect of the bike's design had a purpose. Nothing was there for show, it was just pure sport bike utility. But it wasn't very pretty. Terre Blanche even admitted that the bike didn't photograph well. And it had a double-sided swing arm. Yuck. Now, to say that people didn't like it is a bit of an overstatement. Some people did, but a lot of people absolutely hated it. Most motorcycles that come out bring out two responses to potential buyers. There's the, meh, whatever, and usually that's a reaction to bikes that just look like everything else. And then there's the, okay, I really like that, or I love that. With the 999, it was so polarizing, not in the sense that you either liked it or you didn't. No, you either liked it or you absolutely hated it and were angry that any manufacturer, let alone Ducati, would make something so ugly. But sometimes the smallest groups have the loudest voices. The 999 way outsold the 916 in its debut year, and over its life, it's fair to say that Ducati produced more 999s than 916s, despite the apparent vitriol regarding its overall look. Just three years after its release, Ducati abandoned the 999 and the 1098 was born. This may have been a step into the future in terms of performance, but the 1098 was very much a step back in terms of design and style. Made in the same vein as the 916 and 998, carrying virtually none of the styling cues from the 999, it went back to the single-sided swing arm and iconic headlights. Even the Panigale line would stay pretty much within this design tradition and virtually ignore the 999 9's existence as part of really Ducati's heritage. But why did people react this way? Why did people hate it so much? If you look at automotive trends at this time, both for two and four wheeled vehicles, I think it does kind of begin to make sense. First, the Japanese manufacturers at this time made very few changes to the overall look of their sport bikes. And also retro and cafe racer styled bikes were exploding in popularity. There was a sense in which people were looking back, not forward. So of course a motorcycle that completely abandons its, you know, lauded roots in terms of design would have some hurdles to overcome. But if you look closely at a Ducati 916, as beautiful as it is, and then also look at a Ducati 999, the truth is, in terms of sport bike development and overall design, the 999 has actually aged better. Sure, it might not be as beautiful, that's not really the point. The point is that a 999 looks quite a bit more like a modern sport bike, say an R1, than even the 998 or 1098. 
the more aggressive, angular design. Some even claim that the 999 predicted the move to winglets. This motorcycle could come out today and I'm sure people wouldn't find it all that crazy. But the 999 story is an all too familiar one in automotive history. Being years and even decades ahead of your time isn't always what your company needs, even if that company is known for its forward thinking. For us though, looking back, this actually makes the 999 all the more fascinating. Once you understand Terre Blanche's ruthlessly practical and also totally unromantic and frankly un-Italian approach to design, things do kind of begin to make sense. A closer look at what was once a hated motorcycle reveals something that is so much more than what we see at face value. Unlike the 916, the overall bodywork for the 999 looks like the result of wind tunnel testing, which it was. Again, does this make for a beautiful product? Not always. Unlike MV Agusta's F4, the 999's stacked headlights have a purpose, better lighting. Well, and homologation at the time. The gauge cluster is uncluttered and simple, small and thin, but legible and also tucked in to the windshield unlike the 916, and it feels more coherent and just simpler for the rider. I think this quote from Terre Blanche regarding the response to the 999 is really helpful. He says, I've had lots of letters from lots of people complaining about the 999. I can't worry about five guys who don't like the looks. I care about the 25 guys who sold their GSXRs to buy a Ducati for the first time because they could ride it, because it was more comfortable. For me, the true Ducatista is someone who appreciates the function of the bike and appreciates that form follows function. I don't like to think about the 999 as the oddball in Ducati's sport bike history. Rather, the 916 is the odd one. Prior to its release, Ducati was a function over form kind of company, but the 916 was just too beautiful to not change Ducati's design language forever. Their motorcycles have to be red, and because of that bike and what Tamburini did, they have to be sexy. But today, Ducati has figured out how to kind of meld those two worlds. The worlds of form and function. The ruthless, aggressive, raw look of a Panigale V4 is really a testament to this. Does a new Panigale really look more like a 916 than a 999? I'm not so sure, to be honest. There's an amazing podcast called Brodo GP, and they have an episode, which I'll link below, covering Terre Blanche's designs, and they talk about the ways in which the 999 successfully predicted the future of sport bike and even race bike development, with all the side wings and just the overall low, long stance and the busy, asymmetrical design language. The truth is, Pierre Terre Blanche has always been a designer who was too smart for his own good. Regardless of all this, I think we have to learn to appreciate these motorcycles from history that were hated in their day primarily because they were just different, not because they themselves are actually bad. It's okay to be different, guys. That's the point. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed this video about the most hated Ducati. Be sure to subscribe and check out my other videos as well. And as always, ride safe.